tonight, inside the bikey world. They're good people. They're good friends. They took me in um, when I was a bit loose end in my life. But the way they make their profits is through drug manufacture and drug distribution. If someone is hurt by a member of another club, what happens? Uh, we talk about it. They executed my brother. What difference will tougher laws make? You'd have to build bigger jails because you're never going to stop people from what, hanging up with done friends. Crime? But There's can no... you understand that the, the government is looking at the violence and wanting to be well, seen to be reacting to that? That's not what the that legislation says. I have no criminal record, not even spitting on the sidewalk. So how the hell can he tell me, have you got a criminal record? Yeah. I'm, not people... <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk to him. I'm not allowed to talk to him. Hi, I'm Jenny Brocky. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you all here. Uh, Rowan, I want to start with you. You're Sergeant at Arms with the Rebels in Queensland. The Rebels are the biggest outlaw club in the country. Why did you join? Um, I joined... Uh, I met uh, Rebels in Queensland and uh, they showed me uh, support. They love their motorbikes. I, I love to ride motorbikes. I've been riding motorbikes since the day I turned 16. They're good people, they're good friends. They took me in um, when I was a bit loose end in my life um, and they were there for me. And um, When you say loose end in your life, what do you mean? Uh, I'd split up with my wife, um, my kids had moved away. Um, there they was someone there that, um, you know, they, uh, they liked me, they, uh, they didn't judge me. They, um, they were my mates, you know, and uh, they've just become friends and family ever since, you know. And what sort of rules are there in the Rebels? Um, we have sort of different rules. Um, we have... We don't do ice, we don't do heroin, um, we don't do needles. Um, you don't... You don't do anything that's going to bring your club into disrepute, you know? My actions affect my friends' actions there, you know? Um, so what about other things that are against the law, though? Other how do you mean? Th other than the things that you mentioned? I mean, do you tolerate members breaking the law? I don't... Anything to do with the club, we... If there are such incidents where members have broken the law, it has nothing to do with the club. It's, it's an individual's act. Um, we are not organised crime, we um, not at all. And um, if if a member does something, it's off their own bat, you know. And it's and it's frowned upon because it it brings um, trouble to other people, you know. My actions refer to his actions, you know. Okay, um, Steve, you're from the Life and Death Club in Sydney. Why did you join? <laughs> Fun parties, uh, the Brotherhood, um, commitment. It's. Uh, a group of blokes that get together and they enjoy the same thing. The ride, the party, the music. How does loyalty work in your club? Um, we trust each other. We've got a, a, a good trust between the, the boys. If the rules are that um, your wife or your girl's an extension of your arm, uh, no one touches her, uh, everybody will protect her. It's like a family and we create it as a family. And so if someone is hurt by a member of another club, what happens? Uh, we talk about it. We'll, uh, I'll get it. I'm a very diplomatic person. I'll find out all the avenues first and then I'll take it. There. Before, before what? Um, well, if, depends. If he gets bashed for no reason, then uh, it's not kind of reputation or anything else like that. It's just that it's uh, old school. We'll sort it out. How do you sort it out? One on one. What does that, what does that mean? Well, you come kick my foot, I'll kick yours. Bear, you're from the Gypsy Jokers in South Australia. How long have you been a member? Uh, about 17 years. And how does club loyalty work with the Jokers? Pretty much the same as everybody else. We, uh, We'll stand by each other and keep your brothers, watch your brothers back, and that's about it. Mm. Now, you all call yourself 1% Club. Yeah. 
clubs. What does that mean? What, what does a 1% club mean? It's actually, um, it, it, it goes right back to a, a place called Hollister in, in America. And there was a big party that used to happen there on a regular basis. And um, there was a, a bit of a muck got run one night and uh, the, the mayor of the town came out and made a big speech and said, uh, because of the 1% of the guys that, that ruined this party for you, is, is, um, is, uh, there's no more party anymore. So that's where the 1% actually came from. And it was the, the outlaw clubs that had got into the box ons and that, that, the, that the, the mayor was referring to. So, okay, so what does being an outlaw club <coughs> actually mean compared to another club? It means you don't take shit from anyone, pretty much. And nine times out of ten, they, these guys don't do their job, so it gets left up to us. Okay, Arthur, I can't, over to you. Um, you're head of the New South Wales gang squad. Response to that? A and the response to the description you've heard of, of these bikey clubs? Look, it's a nice marketing ploy on their behalf, and that's what they would like the uh, public and the community to be uh, aware of, as if they're uh, you know, a bunch of social club motorcycle riders who get together on weekends, ride around and contribute to charity. My experience as the head of the gang squad shows that that, in fact, is not the case. Um, our statistics show that 75% to 80% of the senior office bearers within across, right across all the outlaw motorcycle gangs have some type of criminal history and are adversely known to police. Um, in 2009, the gang squad had another portion of it um, implemented, which was Strike Force Raptor. And since their inception, um, they've arrested 1,800 people, all outlaw motorcycle gang members and their associates. They've uh, laid over 4,000 charges. Uh, they've seized uh, over 450 firearms. And within those search warrants, we've discovered uh, drugs, um, amphetamines, uh, ecstasy, uh, heroin, a um, whole host of drugs and, in particular, an emerging trend, anabolic steroids. OK, response. Um, you call associates. Um, I mean, that's a bit unfair. I mean, you're talking about club members here. I mean, associates is a very loose term, as, as we've known before, on the sixth degree of separation they talk about. I mean, that can revert back to anyone. You know, that's, those, I don't believe in those statistics. Um, as such like Well, what that. about the statistics about, about having some kind of criminal background? I mean, how does that apply to you three, for but example? If you, if you look at anybody that's around, 90% uh, of people have got a criminal history. You do a drink driving these days, that's a criminal record. Um, everybody's done a misdemeanour. I, I've, I have, in the past, been in shit with you blokes, but I've, uh, I don't go out and practice it or anything else. I, I like where I'm at in my life. I but like you do ride. have a you do have a criminal past. Yeah. Yeah. For violent offences, yeah? When I was younger. Yeah. Okay. Um, what Doug, do you, what do you what's call the, that? I, I just want to broaden yeah. it out a bit from New South Wales. Doug, what's the situation in Victoria? So Victoria's got about twelve hundred members that we know of, about twenty five clubs, fifty six chapters. Uh, for us, the OMCGs are certainly overrepresented when it comes to prior convictions, not not charges, but actually convictions. So we did... <coughs> OMCG meaning outlaw, outlaw motorcycles. Outlaw motorcycles. Ga gangs. Gang, right. So we, we had a, a look, not at every uh, one of our gangs, but of our larger gangs, and certainly the uh, prior convictions in amongst those that were office bearers uh, did, as Arthur has said, um, around 79 to 80% had significant priors, not for 05, but for offences such as, you know, importing drugs of dependence, importing heroin, uh, serious assaults, affray, significant firearm offences. So, you know, there's certainly over-representation there. Greg, you're from the Brotherhood Christian Motorcycle Club in Sydney. Are you one percenters? No, we're not. But what, what does that mean, that you're not one percenters? Well, around the world there is a whole movement of Christians who love to ride motorbikes. Uh, there's the biggest club from Australia is God Squad, uh, but there's a whole range of different Christian clubs in Australia who've been doing uh, ministry on the fringes of society and that means that we have become friends with some of the guys who are here tonight and uh, I guess our club's perception over the last uh, 35 years we've been doing this is that uh, the issue for us is really the level of criminality and the level of violence and while there's been some clear outbreaks of it from time to time we do think um, that it's been exaggerated by the authorities and we well, do think the evidence supports that. 
How do you... There have been outbreaks of it lately. I mean, the reason we're here doing this program is because there's been there's been, a, a, you know, a, an increased number of violent incidents that have been attributed to bikey groups. Um, Arthur, there's been a big increase in, in shootings in New South Wales in the last, you know, six months, 12 months. Um, are they bikey related? Do you know they're bikey related? And what's going on? Look, there's definitely been a spike in shootings in, over the last six months, you're right. They're not all bikey related, as the term you put it. Uh, some of them are to do with organised criminals, some of them to do with um, drug debts, some of them to do with personal disputes. However, um, there are some that are actually bikey related, if I can put, use that term. We currently have a conflict um, in New South Wales between the Nomads and the Hells Angels Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. Um, that conflict revolves around two issues. Um, territorial dispute over criminal activities and also one of the members from one of those groups is what we call patching over or leaving one club and joining another club, which has resulted in those shootings. We've got a lot of bikey people here. I just want to get a response from you about that description of what's going on in New South Wales at the moment between the Hells Angels and the Nomads. Is that a, We invited them both on, by the way, and they, they decided not to come. What proof is there? This is, this is no, the whole but thing. No, but you know that community. I mean, you must know whether there's a blue going on or not. Is, is this patching over thing happening? Those clubs aren't here. So, like, I'm, I'm, as a member of a club, not going to comment on another club or um, their business within that. But I'm and just so asking whether you acknowledge that any of what's going on is related to... Yeah, Errol. New South Wales would not know. It's not a thing that we discuss on the table. Clive Small, you've been listening to all of this. Uh, you're a former Assistant Police Commissioner in New South Wales. What's your take on what's happening at the moment? Um, I think there's a fair degree of truth spread right around the room so far. The problem I think we've got today, though, is that the bikey environment, if I use that term, has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. And, and that change in the environment is now confusing a lot of the debate about what's bikey related, what's race related, what's a personal vendetta and it's very difficult to distinguish between these things. But, but this, is brought, this is brought on by the bikers themselves changing the rules. Yeah, but with that, Clive, you've got associates as well that you've labelled and um, say for instance, Arthur <laughs> come over and had two with me and then went out again he is then called an associate of a bikie and this is where a lot of these bikie shootings that you say uh, from associates. The times have changed in general, you know. People no, no, are different in general, you know. Uh, there's a lot more violence across the board than, than uh, there ever was. The culture of bikers yeah. have changed. That's what Clive's trying to say. I mean, we had, what, 20 to 30 years ago, uh, the majority of outlaw motorcycle gang members were predominantly uh, Anglo-Saxons. Uh, they joined together the bikes. They went out riding together. Now so you've had a, you, you've you've, you've had you've had a shift where now, particularly if I can use the um, Hell's Angels and the uh, Nomads as examples you mentioned before, the majority of their members now have a Middle Eastern influence and also have Pacific Islander influence, which brings changes of dynamics. In what way? In relation to organised crime, and many in when it, if I say the old days, the old culture, a lot of it was to do about gang loyalty and the interests of the gang. Now we have individuals <coughs> from some of these cultures who've come across it's about self interests and what it, what those individuals can actually get out uh, for themselves and use the, the power and the names of the outlaw motorcycle gangs to progress their criminal activities. So is, are you saying that's where most of the violence is coming from or some of the violence? Some of the violence is coming, is coming directly from that aspect. Clive? Yeah, um, look, I agree, but it seems to me there's a couple of points here. Um, I think the bikey discipline that's been traditional up until in New South Wales, the late 1990s, um, has broken down a lot and the recruitment into bikey groups and even as associates is now a lot more rapid and quick and not a selective for whatever reason. That lack of discipline I think has led to an increase in violence. So that's a problem for within the bikey gangs. Not saying it's necessarily all bikey related but saying they're getting the blame for it because of a breakdown of discipline within the gang. Is that right? But breakdown of discipline? Uh, not on our behalf. I, I, I still believe that... Um we stick by our, uh, our <coughs> club rules. Um, we ride motorbikes. You often see us on television. 
hundreds of us riding across the country. We do it all the time. OK, what do the rest of you think of Clive's description of the way things have changed? They have changed. Yeah, I agree with you that way. In um, some clubs? Yeah. yeah. In ours old school, we'll keep them on as noms for a long period of time. Um, and it's our job as the senior members to progress the noms up and turn them right. What are noms for noms. people at home? Shit kickers. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 no. They're the blokes who are coming into the club that I want to learn and become uh, a member of a family. Um, Fred Rieker, your son Anthony was an associate of the Hells Angels. He was killed at Sydney Airport in 2009. Can you tell us what happened? Um, that morning uh, we had gotten up in the morning about six o'clock. We drove to um, Wollongong so we can paint my daughter's house. Um, Peter the older son and Anthony and I drove down there. And Peter was a Hells Angel? Yes. Um, by midday, Peter received a phone call to go and pick up a mate from the airport. Anthony decided to go and keep him company because it was about an hour's drive. Anthony also said that they'd be back by 3.30. 3.30 came, we started ringing, there was no answer. I started getting agitated. Anyway, five o'clock came, we decided to drive back to Sydney. Um, my younger son <coughs> received a call as we were driving. Um, and uh, my son said, uh, Mum, Anthony's gone. I go, what do you mean Anthony's gone? He says, Mum, they killed Anthony. Now, this was a very widely publicised event at Sydney Airport, wasn't it? Yeah. And is your son still in the Hells Angels, the other son, Peter? As I know, I don't think so. I don't know. I have no, nothing to do with Peter. I haven't spoken to him for about three years. So how do you feel, then, when you hear what you're hearing tonight and when you hear about the violence that's been attributed to bikies in the last little while? I don't know these fellas personally, but one of them said one-on-one. -on -one. Well, it's not one-on-one -on -one because that's not how it was with Anthony. There were so many of them that bludgeoned him to death. In my eyes, just a bunch of cowards. I'm not saying anything. Well, no one here, no guys, one here is from the Hells Angels. I, I hasten to add, we well, did invite them, but they decided not to come. So. It doesn't matter who they are, you know. But or the common to pick or on the, the tiniest person there and to kick him and bludgeon him and stab him and crush his skull with a bullard. As far as I'm concerned, they're all cowards. That's not one on one. You're saying that I now have a right within within your under your code. Yep. I'm allowed I think to go. Should... I'm going to ask you this question straight no, up. You should... To go and murder hey, no, each of the finish. boys, each of the men that murdered my brother. Tonight we're talking with bikies and police about the recent escalation of bikie related violence around the country. Adam, you've written about bikies. What do you think is going on at the moment? I mean, we're hearing about a bikie war. Is there a bikie war? I think it's largely a media uh, creation, that one. I think there are disputes that go on, but I think they're rarely club on club. They're individual disputes. Um, it's, I, I, I find there's been a case been made by certain police forces for extra laws. Uh, I think there's been a, you know, a, a, it's been quite convenient that there has been some conflict. Um, I think there's a, there's a wildly inaccurate uh, reporting of these issues often, and we don't really see uh, a lot of truth. I think it's one of the most hyped and manipulated set of facts I've ever seen. Duncan McNabb in London, uh, you're a former police officer. You've done investigations into bikey clubs around the world. What do you think of what Adam's been saying, and what do you think is going on at the moment? Adam and I will probably disagree quite significantly. Um, this is, 
there is a bikey war going on in Australia at the moment. There's a bikey war actually looming in Europe as well. The major clubs, and I talk about the Hells Angels and the Banditos particularly, um, have a long history of violence toward each other and they have that history of violence not because of some major cultural clash, although in part that does come into it, they have a disagreement over criminal turf. The big clubs like the Hells Angels and the Banditos have spread around the world running a drug business. They run it out of transport hubs, they run it out of places where they've got good access to chemicals and manufacturing plants. That's their business. Um, and it always worries me when I hear some of the, the other gentlemen who spoke earlier talking in it. It's not blasé, but they don't seem to grab the impact of public shootings and bombings. OK, I'd like to put that to you guys, the idea that you're blasé about violence, that you've got different standards yep. about violence to the, the broader community. Fair comment? probably is to some degree because we know that nine times out of ten if we take something to court it's never going to get dealt with properly and they'll just get a smack on the wrist so they're better getting a smack in the head aren't they so really is it up to you to take the law into your own hands well if somebody wants to really attempt to ruin my life or something like that i'm gonna do something back simple as that okay, I, wouldn't, what I wouldn't ask the club to help me i'd go on my own and do it what about the rest of you? Steve? There's more violence on the football field, isn't there? Different standards, though. I mean, the point Duncan's making is that you guys regard violence in a different way to the rest well, of the community. I know this is going to sound controversial, and it is, um, but there is a, there's a perverse sense in which, as a state and a country, we're somewhat lucky that the violence is occurring. Now, if I can explain that, if these guys could stop fighting amongst themselves, join together, we would have a group of something like six to 15,000 people, all heading in the one direction, many of whom are criminals, and we would have a huge problem. The fighting actually keeps them apart. Mm. Mm. Yeah, up to that. I'm totally against violence myself. And I'm saying to you that in the whole of 40 years in my state, there have been only a handful of instances of extreme violence or of guns in the whole of that 40 years in the state of Victoria to do with clubs. Doug, is that right? Yeah, it, it's really interesting that, you know, I listen to what these guys say up there and I, you know, I hear what they say, that there is a brotherhood and a, and, a, and a friendship and a strength in that and I accept, you know, that would be very comforting. One of the things the guys have said is, you know, you can't back down from some of this stuff and, and that, I think, is where part of the issue is. When, when people get insulted or they're disrespected and they need to do something about it, the, the perch and the accessibility to firearms in Victoria and I think everywhere is that they're too easily accessed. We've only been recently policing OMCGs or bikies, but maybe 18 months. Some respect. Call them motorcycle yeah, that's a good question, yeah, Matt. But just let it, I, I want to get him to finish the point. Let him have some respect. Yeah, but let's get him to finish the point that he's well, making, the, the, and then you can make the your gangs point. that I am talking about are those that refer to themselves as outlaw motorcycle clubs. Um, you know, in the first 12 months, we've seized over 50 firearms from our outlaw motorcycle gangs. You know, these are fully automatic weapons. They're handguns. They're pistols. Um, there are a whole myriad of firearms. And are these from yeah. these clubs that aren't here or are they from other clubs as well? Well, there's no, there's no representation from the 1% of Victorian clubs, I don't think, here. But um, certainly we have had some shootings in Victoria that are quite shocking. You know, in the middle of uh, Melbourne at 8.30 in the morning two years ago. Again, um, you know, we have unreported shootings and have had in the last 12 months where bikies have turned up at hospitals with holes in them. Again, not willing to tell us what's gone on. So... The investigation for all law enforcement uh, is really quite difficult because unlike most people in society who want to assist in solving these crimes, we don't get that assistance. Is that right, that no one will assist the police when something like that happens? After 40 years of persecution, why, do you, why, would, why would you expect us, 40 years of persecution by the police, why would you expect us to help the police? When you see this kind of violence, even if it's not your group that's involved, how do you react to it? Let's forget about anything to do with your own clubs. Just when you hear about people being shot, when you hear Frederica telling did that you, story. Did you know that, that the fellow that her son was with that morning had actually been to Adelaide to a UMC meeting to try and stop all this? Did you know that? No. So how mm -hmm. do you react when you hear her he, story? He was actually trying his hardest, along with a whole bunch of us, that started the Free Australia Party and that, 
and all these guys kicked in and started with the UMC and we've been having meetings and everything and discussing things and there was there was a lot of violence happening and then for the last couple of years it's been pretty quiet apart from this little spate of shootings in Adelaide which which a guy Foccarelli was um, he, 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 he got busted with a heap of drugs and they knew he was in the spotlight. He gets busted with a heap of drugs and the police let him carry on out in the public but for, see, even for you three months. But see, even you saying, Bear, a little spate of shootings as though yeah, but it's kind of a small it, thing. I mean, to me, yeah, that's well, not a small thing. Really, it's a, in the overall term of 40 years, there's a little spate of shootings and stuff that, that was all happening around this one time when we were trying to start this UMC and everything and get it all get it all sorted and it was just a little tiny group of people that were fucking carrying on, sorry about the language, that were carrying on like idiots that have caused all this problem and now they want to blanket everybody with it. They're and don't, don't think this is brush. don't think these laws are aiming just at bike clubs that not once does it mention outlaw motorcycle gang. It says group or organisation, which is any group of citizens in this country. Arthur, tell us about the consorting laws that have just been introduced in New South Wales. How are they going to work? The consorting laws uh, are laws that just recently passed in the, in the month of April. It targets um, organised crime networks um, and what it specifically targets is those individuals who have been convicted of indictable offences, that's serious offences, um, from consorting. Consorting means habitually meeting and associating uh, together, not only face-to-face -face meetings but also through telecommunication means, by telephone, sending text messages, email, Skype and the like. Nick, what's your understanding of the consorting laws? Well, uh, consorting laws generally have had a pretty chequered history uh, in our society. They haven't at times been uh, as effective as the politicians would like them to be. But the current version that we have, as I understand it, is this, that if any person, convicted or not, habitually consorts with somebody who has been convicted of indictable offences, now, indictable offences don't have to be too serious, they can be offences that might be dealt with either in the local court or the district court, uh, and if, to satisfy the habitual part, it's with two such people who have been convicted and there are two occasions on which that happens, then, as I understand it, the police can issue the formal warning. And if there is further consorting uh, of that person to whom the warning has been given, then that person can be charged with the offence. So even if, even if they your... have never committed an offence before? Correct. OK, so everyone so that, that here You're making in this room them criminal. Is... Yeah, you buy this law, you're actually making innocent people criminal. So, so you I'm could not make the lady here. Yeah, that's or right. you could make um, Brendan here. But there, is a, but there is a reasonable test. There's the, the word reasonable is used in this legislation. Yes, so that's that, an interpretation. But unless but the contact is, is, is considered reasonable. There, there are some categories of association or consorting. Left up police discretion. How, how about yeah. you go back no, to no, the no, let, him, let him finish. There I are just some categories which are exempted so that... But the onus is on the person who is given the warning to show that the relationship comes into one of those categories. So it has to be yeah, one of family, things. people you're working with, people you're going to education with, people you're in, in, in uh, legal trouble with or in custody with. So OK, reaction to, to the laws. Errol. Yeah, but that, but it, um, it'll take you probably $5,000 to find that if you're allowed to or not, because you'd be charged and then have to go in front of a judge and he can tell you whether you can or cannot associate with that in the right reason. But what do you so, think of the laws in general? And laws in general, um, I, don't, I don't agree with them. You know, you know, consorting, you'd have to build bigger jails because you're never going to stop people from Once hanging up with done friends. Crime, haven't they paid for their crime in jail, done their uh, parole and everything else? Then they walk out, supposed to be a free person, and then get... Fa uh, get uh, <laughs> consorting. Consorting Frank, after that, Frank. yeah. Frank. <laughs> like, once you've done your crime, you, you've done it. You walk away. All right. Can I get a response from you about the laws? Look, the only, the only thing I want to say about the laws is this, that we're, we're police officers, the, the legislators make the laws, we enforce the laws. The laws are designed not to target innocent individuals, they're to target people who are meeting or associating together, planning criminal activities. And OK, the up the back, yes. Before you... One of the problems with the uh, 
consorting laws, my advice is that there's no exemption for clergy or Christian clubs that are involved in ministry to prisoners. So what it goes to is the discretion of the police. And that relates back to what I said earlier. We now have a move away from the rule of law in this, in this country where it is now at the police discretion whether or not I get charged for having a Bible study with an ex-prisoner that I've been helping for the last 10 years. Duncan, what do you think about this response to the problems you outlined? I have a suspicion it might take a lot of resources and get a not a particularly spectacular result. I have some doubts as to whether these laws will do a great deal. Um, it's maybe a little bit of extra equipment for the police to take with them. But I think the major clubs who are involved in crime, the ones that are causing the problems, the ones responsible for the violence, need to be targeted, follow the money trail. Uh, do what investigators all around the world do traditionally. Uh, when you're chasing criminals, you chase the money. Well, Arthur? they do that now. They have an uh, laws uh, um, yeah. of uh, confiscation I, I of assets. How do they go about chasing the money? Yeah, or up the back. Um... I've spoken to an Aboriginal elder this week who's very concerned about the consorting laws because yeah. it doesn't say that it's just motorcycle clubs. When you look at... Um, the incarceration of Aboriginals, and for years and years we've been talking about trying to reduce the over-representation of some groups within, within the criminal justice system. I thought you were in jail because you committed a crime, not because you hung out with a few mates, whether they had a criminal record or not. But can, you, no, under, but can no... you understand that the, the government is reacting to the violence? It's looking at the violence and wanting to be well, seen to be reacting to that. That's not what the legislation says. They're not responding to the violence. That's They're not. not. The argument Adam. has been that the, the motorcycle clubs are the new form of organised crime. There are serious and violent criminals amongst them, that's for sure. But the proposition that they are this new top-of-the-tree organised crime has not been proven. In fact, in the five years that I was right. researching the kind of claims made by, uh, by Duncan and others in his books, um, the, the most serious uh, piece of organised crime came from a very senior policeman, Assistant Commissioner Mark Standard yeah. of the Crime Commission. You know, it All wasn't right, I bikers. Get a, I want to get a response. Who, who, I want, just, who I want just to... happened to be in charge of the NCA when they investigated all the clubs for corruption and found nothing? Arthur? We know that um, predominantly the outlaw motorcycle clubs are involved in organised crime. The, the, the way they make their profits is through drug manufacture and drug distribution. We also know, and we're not just talking about the Hells Angels, we're talking about the Comanchero, we're talking about the Banditos, they have international connections. They, 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 are, they are spreading, we know that Comanchero has recently set up chapters in Spain. Um, in, in Thailand. We know that there's drugs coming from um, Thailand into Australia, you know exported, expo you, exported uh, by uh, outlaw motorcycle clubs. I mean, th this is information which is coming from a variety of sources and a variety of law enforcement bodies. OK, do any of you acknowledge that this crime is going on with people in... in by you? Errol, no, not at all? No, no. Well, not that, a, maybe not a small all. percentage, yes. but, but, you know, in a small percentage where I lived in a... Uh, grew up in a house commission area. The crime rate there was bigger than the bike scene that I've seen in my past year. If they know if such that, things you... are happening, why are they they're saying they know that why, why these things are happening? Why aren't they guys? convicting them? That's right. They, okay. you have we enough are powers. We have, when? How What's many incidents? Statistics? As we said, 12 common charos in relation to the incident over there on a daily basis. Strike Force Raptor. Almost 2,000 uh, 2, people arrested, all outlaw motorcycle gang members and nominees, and 4,000 charges no over now. two okay. and a half years. Right. Yeah. Double, double yeah. then, didn't it? So you don't need okay. the new laws, do you? What's the point I'm Sorry, what, you, yeah. what, the what were you saying, Flo? What were you saying? The figures were <laughs> correct on that. There would be no bikies out. And we would not be here today. <laughs> we'll be in jail. So there's not many now. bikies that, that many... That... Yvette. Your brother was a bandito. The banditos have been mentioned here tonight as being one of the troublesome clubs. Um, he was killed in 1997. What happened? Yes. Um, my brother was actually a bodyguard. Um, he was a bodyguard to the um, Australian leader of the banditos. He was doing it for eight weeks before he was murdered. And basically, my brother, Mick Kay and Sasha, all got lured down into the basement of the Black Market Cafe and they executed my brother and also um, executed Sasha and Mick Kay later died in hospital. Um, so, you know, what can I say? I was, I was only a young girl at the time and... How um, old were you when this happened? I was 15. 
Okay. Things happen, so. so how do you feel listening to this whole conversation? I find it amazing. I want to ask you three gentlemen up on stage there, um, does that give me now a right? Because I know you were talking earlier about the fact of, you know, if someone st stubs your toe, you can go and stub their toe. Mm. Do I now have a right to go and kill the guys that killed my brother? Probably should. <laughs> well, does that, does that bring him back? Does that, does Not that... necessarily. Well, no, it doesn't, does it? That makes... That is only that, makes that me as guy, bad... Is that guy in prison? That only makes me as bad is, is that guy as the in person prison? that shot my brother. Is he in prison? Is he they in are prison? in prison, but... That's good. The that's laws, brilliant. The, they that's, used that's, the laws... They that's used the brilliant. laws that that's... were there, that were in place, that were quite capable of putting him in, in prison yeah. for life. Great. Do you, Fantastic. Do you but, have but any the, idea... But point, but do the... you have any idea how, how extremely... And it must have been the hand of God... That, got, that actually allowed the right people to be in the right place to speak up, as you were saying earlier, you need to have witnesses, and risk their own lives to put those men in jail. Yeah, good on them. Exactly. But, but Bear, I'm interested in what you were saying then, you know, to Yvette, which is probably she should go out and kill the person who killed her brother. Well, he's in prison for the rest of his life, so he might, she might as well have. Well, uh. no. But why is that, that okay? But why is that okay? Why is it okay to think like that? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I suppose. Where that come from, the Bible? Okay, Steve, yeah. do you agree with that? That idea? Like I said, I'm a diplomatic person. I'd talk the whole thing through and then wait up as it come. I mean, this is important stuff we're talking oh, about here. Yeah, I leave it. Really like, you know, so, Bear, you're saying that yeah. I now have a right Within, within your, under your code, yep. I'm allowed, or my father I've, is allowed, I've, I think to go... Should, I'm going to ask you this question straight up. Should, to go and murder on, each let of finish, the boys... Let finish. Or men, they were men. Each of the men that murdered my brother. They're, they're being convicted. I'm asking, I'm asking him, not no, you. Let, sorry, let, her sorry. Have the, let her have I'm the conversation with him. Yeah, let you. her, have, the, let her have, have the conversation with him. They, yeah. they have been convicted, and that's their life gone. So you, you might as well, well have put a no, gun to his head and pulled the trigger. They'll be out in not too long period of time, actually, yeah. but, yep. Yeah. That's, that's it, if but he's if that, really if lucky. That, the point... <laughs> the... All right, we don't condone anybody murdering anybody. That would be like saying, to, do I condone somebody to kill my kids? OK? Don't say that the club has anything to do with that. It's the same rules in society all round. No, if somebody, hang asking. on, hang on. You're saying does our club condone that they, they murdered your brother? Of course they don't condone. I that. didn't I don't ask if they condone it or not. Did brother. I ask that? I didn't ask that. That's I what did you not asked. ask. No, that. she asked Thank a you. very direct question. To, and the direct to question was, either. does your code <laughs> say that she can go and kill somebody? Of course it doesn't. It doesn't condone murder in any way. No club in Australia, motorcycle club, condones maybe, murder in any way. Maybe if we brought in the death, the death penalty <clears throat> over here, maybe it might. Um, put a few people off shooting people. I think that that's... Yeah. That might help. That might well help. Can I ask you, under, under these laws, these consorting laws, it's prohibited to consort with people with criminal records. Is one of the reasons that you object to the laws that a lot of you have criminal records? No, I have uh, no criminal records. Okay. I'm 49 years old. I've been in the club 20 years. I have no criminal record, not even spitting on the sidewalk. So how the hell can he tell me have you got a criminal record? Yeah. I'm not allowed people... to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. I'm not allowed to talk to him. Do, OK, I'm not, su I'm not suggesting everybody... I'm not, I want to make this clear. I'm not suggesting that everybody in bike clubs has I mean, criminal records. Well, I'm not are. saying that. you are. What I, no, I'm not. No. I'm, a, I'm asking whether, whether there's a number who do. And is, Sh you know, Flo, is I there a number... Every... Uh, but how you long know, do we have do to many... put up with it? Should I get locked up? Put up no, but I'm just, asking, I'm just asking the question if that's one of the reasons you object to the laws. That's, that's where we have a problem, because I don't know who's got a criminal record and who hasn't. That's right. That's so, exactly the point. If I have, how do you know that I I've don't got to have make sure I don't talk, talk to certain to people. This show. Well, do you? Yes, I do. That's irrelevant. Why is... Okay. Well, do you think it's irrelevant that we talk no. now? No, but I'm asking, well, but I'm asking if part of your objection to the laws is that they will directly affect some of you because you do have It'll criminal directly records. affect you too. It'll directly affect everyone. It would I mean, be like a virus so many people and affect and every single, single person, person because That's right. half the people that got records and talk to the people that haven't got records, right. and then they're going to be convicted. Then everybody's going to have a record. 
Can, can I ask? Okay, can I get? Can I? Okay, can I get? Can I get some reaction from others to this? Yeah, Nick Cowdery, what do you think about these laws? You've prosecuted bikies as director of public prosecutions in New South Wales. How, how do you react to them? Indeed, the the what are described as traditional laws are very effective, and the police work very hard to make them effective. In our Crimes Act, we have laws against criminal gangs already, and we've had a lot of prosecutions of people against those provisions, Section 90. 3S uh, and, and thereabouts in the Crimes Act uh, and even had people pleading guilty to those offences. So we, we have, um, uh, I think, uh, an arsenal of traditional laws that are very effective. The police work very hard to put them into effect and we have been getting results for years. All right. Um, I want to ask a couple of the women here. Deb, what about you? you you've been hanging around bikey clubs for quite well, a long I time. I you know, like, I'm not going to give up my way of life to no one, OK? I, I just, I like to go to bike shows, tattoo shows, everything. So if I go to any of the tattoo shows or anything like that, that means I'm consulting with some friends that I've got. I'm not willing to give that up either. I mean, that's just a load of crap as far as I'm How concerned. are you going to apply this, Arthur? I mean, how, how, how do you work out what is reasonable contact with somebody with a conviction? Not sure. Look, <laughs> what we've done in, in terms of this legislation at the moment, there's four individuals who have been charged and all that, those four individuals are members of an outlaw motorcycle club yeah. and they were, they were targeted specifically in relation to the current shootings. So we use a legislation to, as I said, prevent acts of violence and protect the community. And, and is it's that only one, something... It's only one, according to what Mr Cowdery said, it's right, it's only one piece of legislation that we use to prosecute individuals and charge individuals. That's only very small. It's only just been introduced. And are you, do you see this law as a law specifically for the bikey situation? I mean, is that primarily the focus? No, it's not about, just about bikes. It's organised criminals and what we call recidivist offenders. Tom, you were um, the founding member of the Outlaw Club, The Descendants, in South Australia. Now, you were jailed under old association laws, is that right? Old yeah, consorting well, as, laws. Yeah, as Nicholas referred to earlier, the, uh, there's a very chequered past with the consorting laws. They, and once, you know, back in the 70s, it was used against a club in, uh, in South Australia by the so-called bikey squad up there that was set up to do that. Three quarters of our club had no convictions. We were only a club of a dozen guys, so we only had three guys with the convictions. We had nine without. And uh, after about nine months and between 20 and 30 consorting bookings at our clubhouse, at our parties, on our rides, we fronted court and we all got three months jail. Um, so for any suggestion, that these laws will work. Look at history. Our club's still going. We went to jail. It solidified us. It made us a stronger bond because we fought them. Because we, funnily enough, the bizarre outcome is that if you discontinue hanging around with your friends, we'll put you in jail and make you hang out with them. And that's what happened. <laughs> you wanted to get back at the person who did No, no, not in particular, no. No, but I did, I did enact a little bit of revenge later on when I bumped into someone, so... What did you do? Let's talk about one other aspect of the laws, about tattoo parlours. How are they going to work, Arthur? They've only just been introduced and all, all it will mean is that... Um, individuals who want to run tattoo parlours will have to apply to the Department of Fair Trading for a licence and uh, provide all the particulars which will involve taking photographs, making sure that the, the right individual is taking fingerprints and then issuing those individuals with licences. Why, the focus, why the focus on tattoo parlours? Well, I believe the tattoo parlours are synonymous with outlaw motorcycle clubs and we've had a lot of problems with them in the past. A lot of them have been targeted for shootings, fire bombings and the like, so I believe we just want to tighten up the industry. All right, Bear, you've got a tattoo shop in South Australia which yep. won't be affected by these laws because yep. they're New South Wales laws. Oh, it will be eventually because if it's brought in here, it will be brought in in other states. Right. Okay, why have there been so many shootings and fire bombings and allegations of standover tactics there's, around there's, tattoo parlours? There's not that many. There's, there's probably four or five incidents I can think of in the 23 years that I've been tattooing. There's about four or five incidents I can think of where shops have been shot up and... Well, your shot was shot up. Yeah, it certainly was. So what and, happened? And uh, not much at all, really. Um, well, there was shooting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and what happened there as a result of that? The windows got smashed and a few other bits and pieces. And, and revenge? No, not really. No. 
Well, that's not my understanding of what you told us about what happened afterwards. Uh, you wanted you wanted to get back at the person who did no, it. No, no, not in particular, no. No, but I did I did enact a little bit of revenge later on when I bumped into someone. So. And what was that? But I didn't go looking for him. What did, What did you do? I, I I was involved in a shooting, yes, in a return shooting. Were you doing the shooting? No, I was driving the vehicle. And so what happened as a result of that? Um, I did my time and I got found guilty and I did my time and that's that. So why was the tattoo shop shot up in the first place? Because somebody, a bunch of cowards fucking driving around fucking shooting up empty shops. What, just any old people, not, huh? not another bikey uh, gang? They were another club. Okay. That's, that's as far as I'll go with it. So can you see why people looking at that would say there's a problem there? That's right. What, out of four incidents that I know of in this whole country. Yeah, but I mean, shops don't get shot up. You know, the local cake shop doesn't get shot up. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. Domino's. Yeah, up the back. Up the back, yeah. Domino's, their little scooter things just got a whole torch. A whole torched. So there Nick, are you've got a you've got a tattoo shop. How do you feel about this? I've, I've been in a family operated tattoo shop business for 15 years. Now I'm an OMC member. I have been for that long as well. The police have never been called to my shop. There's never been any incidents. It's my only trade. It's my livelihood. I actually tattoo people. I don't own it or operate it like that. Now my daughter and my ex-wife, they own the business and run it and like that. Because they're associated with me, is that going to close my shop down? Look, just because you're a, you might be a member of an outlaw motorcycle club doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be prevented from actually applying well, for and getting, and getting a license. That's what the law states. Have you read the legislation? And There's 43 what, what, pages what, of yep, legislation just say saying this, that. Okay, Whilst I make the application um, and the for the licence of the Department of Fair Trading, it'll be up to the Commission of Police to determine who is a fit and proper person to be able to uh, obtain one of those licences and whether Can it's I in the public interest. Okay. 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 This is just... Honestly, this Act is the worst Act that I have seen. It is worse than the Criminal Organisations Control Act. It's worse than the consorting amendments to the Crimes Act. It firstly requires an applicant for a licence to give their fingerprints and palm prints, and if they don't, that's it. They don't get a licence. It goes to the Director General, who must then send it on to the Police Commissioner. Now, if the Police Commissioner finds that this person's not a fit and proper person based on criminal intelligence or criminal information, which is not used anywhere else in our legislature, nowhere is this word, these two words used, then he doesn't give reasons. So you can't appeal if you don't know why you've not uh, got your licence. And I guarantee, because the police have been saying it for months, that this act is here to get rid of outlaw motorcycle club members from tattooing. That's what the police have been saying. But is that because there's a problem with the tattoo shops? That there people... is not. Jenny, a couple of tattoo shops might have had problems over the years, but what about the other 1,000 or 1,500 or the 3,000 employees? Why should they be punished? But anecdotally, Wayne, you yes. hear stories of people being stood over. You do. You hear, you yes. hear yeah, stories that of that all yes, the that time. Yes, that does happen, and that's wrong, well, and that's got to be addressed. No, 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 not in tattoo studios. Trying to open tattoo studios if they're yes. not... If they're not associated with the right people. You hear those stories. Yes, we've heard them and that has got to be addressed and the United Motorcycle Council is going to address those issues where people uh, have problems if they want to open it in somebody else's perceived territory. Now, we've... that's now, something Now, why that... would that... Why is that an issue? <coughs> same as we've heard the same stories in the media that you have. Just because I'm on the UMC... I haven't, I'm or... not getting them from the media. I'm getting them from elsewhere. And I've heard them Police. just around the... Place. Long before doing this story, I've heard them. Uh, of course. We know it does point. happen, and anecdotally only, so we don't know to what extent it does happen. But by and large, it really is only a small part of the tattooing business, and it only affects a small part of the uh, small amount of tattoo shops. But we don't really know to what extent it does happen. But it has got to change completely. Can I say a couple of things about that. Look, in the last two years, we've had 18 incidents where tattoo parlours have been shot up or firebombed. One of them um, involved <coughs> the the murder of, of a human life. So you got that as, as, that aspect what of the world. Okay, yeah. Greg. Yeah. The thing to change. Can I say a couple of things about that? Look, in the last two years, we've had 18 incidents where tattoo parlours have been shot up or firebombed. One of them um, involved <coughs> the, the murder of, of a human life. So you've got that, as, as, that aspect what of the world. OK, yeah. Greg, yeah. The, thing, the legislation that enacts that movement is open-ended. 
it doesn't target what the police keep saying that they're targeting. That's why we're passionate about it as a Christian club. We're very concerned that this is the thin end of the wedge. This is actually opening the door for a whole raft of laws which are aimed at citizens and controlled by police discretion. Nick, I'm interested you're nodding your head there. And I just wonder, listening to this whole conversation tonight, I mean, as somebody who's prosecuted bikies as, as the DPP in New South Wales, um, presumably for some violent crimes on occasion. And drugs. Drugs and violence. Drugs and violence. How do you reconcile this? Well, first of all, the laws. I think the point that's just been made is valid. Um, we had a very quick and uh, quickly uh, composed reaction to the threat of terrorism after 9-11. But our lawmakers <coughs> have taken the terrorism response and applied some of those uh, ideas and extensions to the fight against ordinary crime. And I think that we run a very big risk of infringing people's liberties and rights if we take that sort of course. And you see it evolving over time. They try a bit more, they try a bit more, they try a bit more. OK, where does all this leave you now? I mean, you're all angry about these new laws. Where does, where does it leave you? Wayne, you, what are you going to do as a lawyer? Well, hopefully fight them, try and get rid of them. The laws are dangerous, extremely dangerous, not just because they will be used against members of OMCs. After they're finished with members of OMCs, they'll be used against other people. I'm going to stand up for my Keep rights as an on. Australian. What doing. Keep this free and what about your relationship now? with the police? Well, well, I mean... Continue uh, it just the way it's always been, I'd say. Well, I don't want to be looking at me back saying, oh, if I'm going to go talk to... Bear, <laughs> he's, he's got a criminal history. Well, so have you. So have I. So we're concerned. And so have you. Yeah, yeah so have right. And do you know that since I've been in the motorcycle club 18 years, I've had one small possession charge for a joint, you know? And uh, I'm a lot better person now that I'm here. I've got more people that I'm responsible for, you know? What I do reflects others, you know? OK, we do have to wrap up, everyone. I'm sorry we're out of time, well out of time. Um, but you can keep talking about this online. Insight is taking a short break, but we'll still be on Twitter and Facebook, so join us there. We'll be back on air again in July. Now, stay tuned for Dateline and World News. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> it was good.